so thank you uh, for the invitation, Dr. Altman, to speak at your guys's. Um, I guess it's uh, the University of Washington Allergy Division um, Journal Club or academic meeting. Um, I'm Dr. Jennifer Lighting. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Florida, um, which is based in Tampa, Florida. Um, and I share part of my time with the university uh, doing research and teaching, and then my clinical um, effort is spent at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, which Dr. Altman and I were just speaking about, an affiliated hospital uh, with uni the University of South Florida. Um, I'm a clinical immunologist, and so I see patients primarily with immunologic diseases, um, primary immunodeficiency diseases. Um, I wear many hats at this university, including um, uh, do, being the director of our newborn screening program. I oversee our immunology service and um, the multidisciplinary efforts of our immunology service, um, and also oversee faculty development in the, uh, in the Department of Pediatrics. So those are kind of the different hats I wear. I run a lab and I'm very involved in clinical research, specifically for chronic granulomatous disease. Um, so this talk, um, when I put it together, kind of with some of the guidance from Dr. Some guidance from Dr. Altman is a little bit of a potpourri, <laughs> so I'm going to kind of move around a little bit. I'm going to talk about neutrophil disorders at the beginning and then kind of um, morph into immune dysregulation. I'm very uh, informal, so if you guys have questions, please just, I'm happy to stop and answer them, or if you want to wait till the end, that's, that's okay as well. Um, as far as disclosures, I do have several. I'm a speaker and consultant for several pharmaceutical companies. Um, I also receive grant research funding from Horizon, which is now Horizon Therapeutics. Um, I don't think any of that is relevant to this talk. Um, and I do have some several cases built into this lecture, and all of them are real. I did not make them up for the purposes of this lecture, and they're all cases uh, from Florida. So just some of the learning objectives. Um, we're going to discuss infectious and inflammatory manifestations of neutrophil disorders, uh, discuss non-infectious presentations and manifestations of primary immunodeficiency, and identify some newer rare defects of the immune system that cause immune deficiency. So diving right in, um, just looking at diseases of neutrophils, as I mentioned, I'm going to start with neutrophil disorders. Um, diseases of neutrophils account for about 10 to 20 percent of primary immunodeficiency diseases and patients suffer from severe recurrent bacterial and fungal infections. These infections typically affect the respiratory tract, the skin, um, and the oral cavity, and they can be very deep infections. Uh, there can be, I should say, very deep infections of the liver, brain, et cetera, that might clue you into a neutrophil disorder. <coughs> I don't know why it's not advancing. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay, so thinking about the life of a neutrophil, I, I always teach our fellows this because when you think about just sort of the lifespan of a neutrophil, it makes it easier to maybe identify or understand where, there, where diseases might uh, present themselves. So a neutrophil develops in the bone marrow. Um, once it has matured enough, it leaves the bone marrow and emigrates, uh, leaving the marrow into the circulation. And so this uh, picture down at the bottom of the screen is taken right out of our ABOS textbook showing um, uh, leukocyte adhesion and um, migration. And you can see, um, you know, the leukocyte um, over, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not, I'm pointing at it, the leukocyte over to the left. Um, good, you can see it, I see a thumbs up. <laughs> and so the leukocyte is moving along in the circulation. And what happens is that the leukocyte, and in the, this case, the neutrophil, is stimulated to go somewhere to fight an infection or to clean up a mess or do something within the, the vasculature. And you can see that the leukocyte does this really kind of eloquent um, procedure where it slows down on the surface of the endothelium, binding to different ligands, and then it squeezes through in two endothelial cells, goes into the tissue, which is this blue space, and leads to, you know, either direct killing of microbes or stimulates cytokine production to lead to other immune responses. Once it does all of this, it then dies. So the neutrophil lives typically for around seven hours. Your marrow makes tons of it when it's being stimulated uh, to, to create neutrophils. It goes in, it does its job, and then it dies. So when you think about diseases of the neutrophil, this is a, a review article I wrote a few years ago 
um, that just touches on sort of the more common neutrophil disorders, or certainly more than is listed in the, even in this article. I separated kind of the way I think about it is disorders of neutrophil quantity, disorders of morphology, disorders of chemotaxis, and disorders of function. And this picture um, that's on the on the right shows kind of a diagram that we made just showing, again, highlighting some of where there's defects in immigration from the bone marrow, again, um, some defects in neutrophil um, rolling or adhesion to the endothelium, chemotactic defects and bacterial defect or uh, bacterial killing defects. So what is the definition of neutropenia? Neutropenia is when you have less than a thousand poly polymorphonuclear cells per microliter of blood. Um, your infection rate goes up as your neutrophil count goes down. So when we have a neutrophil count that's consistently less than 500, patients are certainly at high risk for invasive infections. And then uh, acute is much worse than chronic. So folks that develop acute neutropenia, the most common cause is typically chemotherapy or iatrogenic. They're at much higher risk of infections than those who are at, who have chronically uh, been neutropenic. And then secondary causes are much more common than primary. So although I'm gonna talk about the primary disorders, in reality, secondary causes of neutropenia are much more common, uh, things like, um, uh, key, you know, chemotherapy or other drugs that might cause acute neutropenia. So cyclic neutropenia is one of the most common types of uh, primary neutropenia and is very board relevant for those who are, who are fellows listening to me talk. Um, and what you see is regular oscillations in the neutrophil count that occur about every 21 days. Um, you can see this is actually a picture of the original family uh, that was described as having human cyclic neutropenia, and they were later found to have mutations in Elaine, which is the cause of cyclic neutropenia. So that's why it looks, you know, it's kind of a historical picture um, and looks a little, you know, non- uh, um, not as sophisticated as our as our pictures nowadays. Anyway, so during the nadir, uh, patients can have fever, malaise. We see aptostomatitis, lymphadenopathy, soft tissue infections. They can have severe infections, including sepsis, although this is less common. Manifestations are typically in childhood, and this uh, cyclic neutropenia is due to mutations in a gene called Elaine, which is uh, inherited in an autosomal mm -hmm. dominant fashion. You often need serial ANCs, you know, every few days. Uh, for at least six weeks to establish a diagnosis. And then other cell counts can vary as well. You can see this in the, the diagram where the monocyte count is, is sort of going up and down along with the neutrophil count. And treatment is typically with recombinant GCSF. So severe chronic neutropenia, there are actually four kinds, um, and they are all related to genes that have to do with neutrophil regulation or transcription. So type one is also, is, is really the most common and is due to mutations in Elaine. So you just heard me mention Elaine. Elaine can have, you know, the same gene can cause either cro severe chronic neutropenia where you are always um, in a chronic severe neutropenic state, or it can also cause cyclic neutropenia. So sort of two different manifestations with the same gene. Um, and then you can see the other types, type two, type three, SCN3 is HAX1 deficiency, um, which is also called Kosman syndrome, um, is a recessive disease. It was actually found in Scandinavia when it was initially described and was a founder effect because of, um, uh, you know, it was, a, it was due to a founder effect, I should say. Um, and then type four, which is defects in G6PC3, typically there are other manifestations, including cardiac and urogenital defects that might help you differentiate between the other three types. So how do you diagnose chronic neutropenia? Well, uh, bone marrow biopsy is quite helpful. You typically see an arrest of myeloid development. You can diagnose this on a peripheral smear with really just loss of neutrophils in the peripheral smear. Um, obviously, a CBC helps you diagnose neutropenia. And then genetic testing um, to confirm the specific gene that might uh, be implicated. Treatment is with a recombinant GCSF or Dupagen and then bone marrow transplantation, um, depending on the defect present. All right, so I'm going to move on to a case. Uh, we recently, this is this is not about neutropenia. We're now moving on to neutrophil morphology issues, but this is a case that we recently published. Um, I published this actually with a pediatric resident um, and is a kind of a cool case that presented to our hospital. So a, a, a young 13-month-old Sudanese male 
Um, so he had presented with two previous episodes of cellulitis. He did not have cellulitis, cellulitis at the time of presentation, but instead, or presentation to us, but instead had high fever, emesis, and weakness. He ends up having a CT scan um, that shows this, which is a, uh, for those who are not used to looking at head CTs, is a giant abscess or space occupying lesion in his brain. Um, he undergoes a partial craniotomy and the cultures from that craniotomy yielded MSSA or methicillin sensitive staph aureus. So as part of his evaluation, um, he, he was evaluated for neutrophil disorders and one of the main um, uh, diagnostic considerations at the time was chronic granulomatous disease. And I'm gonna walk you through that, the dihydrorotamine test um, uh, just at this point in the talk, although I will outright say this patient does not have CGD. So um, at the time we were considering it. So how do you, what is it, how do you diagnose CGD with a DHR? Well, you take whole blood and you put it into a flow cytometer and whole, the flow cytometer differentiates um, granulocytes from all other cell types in the whole blood. And they do that, uh, it does that based on side scatter and forward scatter. So you can see um, in this histogram or this graph over to the left, side scatter and then forward scatter. And your granulocytes are really at the upper right hand corner of uh, that graph because they are the biggest, most granular cells. Those cells are then isolated and stimulated with something called PMA, which is a nonspecific stimulant. Um, when they are also, the cells are also tagged with a fluorescent tag. Once they, once they are stimulated, they produce superoxide and that fluorescent tag fluoresces, which is detected by the flow cytometer and is picked up and um, measured. And so what you get is the number of cells or mean fluorescence intensity. It's not really number of cells. It's really MFI or mean fluorescence intensity of how much those cells are fluorescing, which directly correlates with the amount of superoxide that they are making. So what should be normal, and you can see on the left-hand panel here, is that all of your cells should make, or all of your granulocytes should make superoxide, and that should be detected by the flow cytometer. In someone with excellent CGD, which is in the right-hand panel, where there is uh, very little, if any, superoxide made, that peak is never going to move, it's never going to fluoresce, it's never going to be detected by the flow cytometer. In somebody who has um, recessive CGD, where there might be some amount of superoxide um, produced, although be it not normal, you may have a little peak detected with a small MFI that is still not normal, but is not zero. And then in women who are X-linked or, or girls who are X-linked female carriers of CGD, they're going to have two peaks. They're going to have uh, a peak that does not move, does not get stimulated, or does not, uh, I should say, produce superoxide, and then they're going to have a second peak that is normal. And this happens with a phenomenon called lionization, where um, uh, female cells express one X chromosome, and so that should be roughly 50-50. You should have about 50% of neutrophils having the normal X expressed and 50% having the abnormal X expressed. So so in our patient, you can see this is his DHR. Um, on the left-hand part of it is our healthy control. You can see granule sites are isolated. Um, the pe the, this peak shifts and it looks great. Um, if you look at our patient on the right, the biggest thing you notice right away is that it's very difficult to isolate his granulocytes because that population is falling into the lymphocyte population. It's like co-mixing. And then when you pick out whatever you think looks the most like granulocytes and stimulate them, we get multiple peaks. So we're getting some, what we think are granulocytes that look like they're not making superoxide. We're getting some that are normal, some that are abnormal. Um, and so this is uh, an inconclusive and abnormal DHR. So when I first got a hold of this, I thought the main problem is your granulocytes aren't granular. What makes them fall into the lymphocyte population is loss of granularity. So they're the same size as lymphocytes, but they've lost their granularity. And so the way to look at this, the easiest way to look at this is a peripheral smear. So the patient is on the right and the a normal control is on the left. And so you can see in the normal control, these tiny little purple dots are granules. Um, they're granules that are inside of neutrophils. And this is a typical bilobed appearance of a neutrophil um, nuclei. 
On the right, you can see there's this paucity or really loss of granularity inside the cytoplasm of the neutrophil. And then the nucleus just looks very abnormal and kind of clumping all together. That's not how neutrophil nuclei, nuclei look normally. So this patient ended up having a granule deficiency. So when you think about neutrophil granules, there are primary and secondary granules. Primary granules contain all these proteins that I've listed here that are all bactericidal, um, important for killing of certain um, organisms. And then secondary granules are what are listed below. These are also called specific granules. So primary granules are called azurophilic granules and secondary granules are called specific granules. So this patient ended up having a disease, disease called specific granule deficiency where there is an absence of primary or secondary granules. You get this abnormal looking nuclei within the nucleus. Um, you have a deficiency in microbicidal proteins and recurrent bacterial and fungal infections um, with things like Pseudomonas and Candida. It is an autosomal recessive disease and due to mutations in a gene called CEBP epsilon. It is, um, there is a, a population bias for this disease and is much more common in uh, folks who are from the Mediterranean basin. So the fact that this patient is Sudanese uh, certainly made him at higher risk. And um, when we ended up getting his family history, his parents are um, first cousins. So there is some consanguinity in the family. Um, the diagnosis is made microscopically, or you can actually stain for these microbicidal proteins. Um, in his case, we did genetic testing, which showed the genetic defect in CEBP epsilon. And treatment is typically supported or prophylactic antibiotics. There have been patients that have undergone bone marrow transplant for this disease, but it's very single case, um, and it's not clear what the outcomes or sort of natural history of that is. Okay, moving on to CGD, which is always my favorite topic. So this is a giant cell. You're supposed to pretend this is a giant cell, <laughs> this big black circle. And the, the um, light blue sort of half circle is the surface of the phagolysosome. And so within the cell is a phagolysosome. On the surface of the phagolysosome is the NADPH complex. This complex, which is, you can see in all these different colors, is not constitutively expressed. So it comes together when the cell is stimulated. P22 and GP91 hang out on the um, membrane surface, whereas P47, P40, and P67 are cytoplasmic proteins and come together. And then you also have RAC that's here. There's actually a new protein in this complex called CYBC1, which I need to update my slide. I just didn't include it uh, today. But what happens when the NADPH complex is stimulated is that NADPH donates a hydrogen, which then leads to the um, uh, influx of uh, radical oxygens and superoxide uh, production inside the phagolysosome, which then leads to direct killing of certain bacteria and fungi. When you have mutations in any five of these proteins, you get CGD. Now, they all have different inheritance. They all have different phenotypic um, uh, consequences, but they uh, all cause CGD. So X-linked CGD is by far the most common, occurs in about 70% of patients, and there can be female carriers of, you know, X-linked female carriers of this genetic mutation, which is what I showed you on the DHR earlier. Recessive CGD is less common, although the most common type of recessive CGD is due to mutations in NCF1. Um, which is P47 FOX deficiency, uh, followed by NCF2 and CYBA. There are actually now several cases of, um, of P40 FOX deficiency as well, which is NCF4, but again, a handful of cases uh, that have led to CGD. So, oh, sorry that this kind of got thrown off. I think this is the MAC PC uh, where they don't get along. Um, so you can see the most common types of organisms that infect patients with CGD. Uh, what these organisms all have in common is that they are catalase positive organisms. Uh, so the top five are the top five most common in North America. As far as I know, this has been on every um, allergy and immunology board exam since the existence of the board exam. So these are five organisms that your fellows want to memorize um, as part of uh, the spectrum of CGD. Salmonella and BCG are much less common and occur more in the developing world. 
Um, and then others that are rare, but I think are worth mentioning, are things like Chromobacterium violaceum, Francisella filomeragia, granulobacter, et cetera. And the top two, why they're kind of important, and probably to you guys in Seattle as well, I imagine, is that they are organisms that are found in brackish water. So brackish water is where freshwater and saltwater meet. It's very brown looking. Um, and so these organisms grow in that area. With the Tampa Bay region where I live, the Hillsborough River dumps right into Tampa Bay. So there is tons of brackish water in our, in our bay. And so we have to give um, very specific recommendations to our patients about where they can swim or be exposed. Um, this is a review I wrote with Steve Holland many years ago, just kind of uh, showing the wide spectrum of infections that patients are susceptible to. This is this list just grows every day, so it's still, I'm sure, behind at this point. Uh, but you can see, <coughs> you know, different species of Burkholderia, Nocardia, Aspergillus is the most type common type of fungal infection, other invasive molds, and even yeast infections that occur can occur in CGD patients. Did Burkholderia have another name at some point? It used to be called Pseudomonas cepacea. So it was in the Pseudomonas family um, and it changed uh, its genus name to Burkholderia probably about 10 years ago and is now Burkholderia cepacea. Um, but it was, it's, Burkholderia is the common organism that's found in cystic fibrosis patients that is a really bad predictor of death once they become infected with that organism. So you may have remembered it from that from from those types of patients. Um, all right. I don't know why there is um, <laughs> that on the slide. Anyways, okay, so how you treat um, CGD patients. So the backbone of therapy is prophylactic antibiotics and antifungals. This is daily antibiotics. So we typically use Bactrim because that has the widest spectrum. I see a lot of people go wrong on this and that they dose spectrum like twice a week or three times a week, which is what you use for PJP prophylaxis. This really needs to be daily prophylaxis. Um, and then an azol for antifungal therapy. And this needs to be an azol that covers aspergillus. So ketoconazole and fluconazole are not sufficient. It needs to be itraconazole, vori, or posaconazole uh, have been shown to be effective. Prophylactic immunomodulatory therapy, so interferon gamma, is also indicated uh, for prevention of infections in patients with CGD. Um, chronic monitoring of patients includes just sort of chronically following labs and always searching for, for infections. These patients will often become infected before they present with clinical signs. So I typically follow imaging um, and inflammatory markers um, uh, as pertinent. And then curative therapy includes transplants or hematopoietic stem cell transplant or gene therapy, which I'm going to get to in a couple slides. Some of the inflammatory manifestations. So uh, CGD, in addition to having a large infection susceptibility, also has a lot of inflammatory um, uh, disease manifestations. And this is really anything from head to toe. And so I've listed the majority of them on the slide. But the major ones that are associated with morbidity include granulomatous lung disease or chronic respiratory insufficiency, um, the liver disease. So uh, we can, you can also have granulomas in the liver or non-regenerative hyperplasia and portal hypertension of the liver, chronic transaminase elevation. Um, and then uh, the other major one is the gut. So chronic colitis, about 50% of CGD patients will suffer from Crohn's disease like colitis. It's very difficult to manage and is a high, um, has a lot of morbidity associated with it. <coughs> um, the hyperinflammatory response that we see in CGD is due to an overactive host response to infectious agents, but also can occur independent of infection. Um, so these are just all examples of publications where we've seen the overactive host response to infectious agents, so nocardia, mulch pneumonitis, staph liver abscesses, et cetera. And then patients with CGD are just, because of having CGD, are predisposed to having autoimmunity and things like ITP and lupus and arthritis and other autoimmune manifestations. <laughs> So I use the abscess um, story as an example of the infection um, uh, infection risk and the inflammatory response. This was actually my first publication as a fellow. Seems like it was forever ago now. Um, and 
you can see, so patient, so just to walk you through this, A through D on the top row is one patient and A through D on the bottom row is a second patient. So two separate patients. Both of these patients presented with liver abscesses. And as you can see by the imaging, were essentially inoperable. I think in a uh, patient, um, don't quote me on this, but I think in patient A, other than the obvious size is also in rat and um, was around the vital um, blood structures like the portal vein and the hepatic artery. And then patient B down here also size. I mean, you'd have to li literally remove like half or two thirds of their liver to remove this entire lesion. And so as you see time go by between A, B, C, and D, the patient was treated with antimicrobials, was not responding to antimicrobials alone. And then eventually steroids were started in order to reduce the inflammatory response that was occurring locally at the liver and allow for better penetration of antibiotics. So the patient received about one per kilo of steroids that was tapered over about two to three weeks. We actually do a much slower taper now. We've shown that that um, is much more effective and it can, can lead to complete resolution of these abscesses without need to do any uh, surgery. Um, and so this is just one example. The ones I listed on the previous slides are very similar in that they, uh, you, when you concurrently treat with steroids, you have a better response uh, to your antimicrobials because of the reduction in the inflammatory response. All right, IBD and CGD. So the um, inflammatory bowel disease in CGD is quite common, as I mentioned. Um, there is not a symptom that occurs in CGD that's specific to CGD colitis. You really get the same symptoms that anybody with IBD would get, uh, including abdominal pain, diarrhea, and constipation. There is a high frequency of growth disturbance, so you're going to see these kids not growing, um, especially in height. They might grow out, but not up, and so we start seeing that when there's um, uh, colitis present. Um, how do you manage CGD colitis? So it's difficult. I'll just sort of say that at the beginning. Uh, steroids are the backbone of treatment and often patients are on them lifelong. Um, other agents are tried, uh, metronidazole, 6-MP, salicylic acid derivatives, and mesalamine. They have mixed success. Usually not one, usually they are um, adjunct therapy, so you're using, using them in addition to steroids. They typically are not steroid sparing. Um, Anti-TNFs have shown to be harmful. Um, they do resolve colitis and CGD, but they place patients at very high risk of infection and even death. Um, and so they're avoided in CGD colitis. Anakinra has been tried and shown to be not very effective. Vetalizumab has been used, which is an alpha-4 beta-7 integrin inhibitor. Um, and at least in my clinical, my clinic, I have several patients on vetalizumab, and we've actually had very good success with it. But the overall consensus is that it's, there's, it's not a long-lasting effect. And at least in my patients, we've been able to reduce, reduce steroid doses substantially when using vetalizumab. So I do like it. Um, and then as a last case scenario is surgery. All right. So looking at transplants and CGD. So a recent article literally just came out. I don't know why it says 2021. I guess I'm trying to trying to get us there faster. <laughs> it came out in 2020. Um, uh, it was a European group that looked at over 700 patients with CGD that were transplanted. And so this is, you know, across the spectrum as far as types of donors, types of um, conditioning regimens, the status of the patient prior to transplant, all of that is really heterogeneous. But they all have CGD and they're all transplanted in Europe. And so you can see the overall survival is quite high. It's around 85%, which has been in line with what we've seen in North America as well. Um, their event-free survival um, was around 75%, and events included things like graft-versus-host disease or transplant-related complications. Um, you can see that age did impact survival, so the younger that you were, especially less than 18, um, the better the survival you had versus over the age of 18. They actually looked at pre-existing colitis as a um, predictor for not doing well in transplants. Um, and that is not this graph here. I'll get to that in a second. But they looked at it and did show that having colitis or having a history of colitis did impact your survival. So you were more likely to survive if you did not have colitis than if you did. Um, as a historical feature. There was no, you know, discussion about the control of that colitis or even management of that colitis, just whether you had it or not. 
So interestingly, that's uh, the reason I point that out is that is different from a, a publication that Rebecca Marsh and, and many of us, uh, myself included, um, from the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium published about a year ago, <coughs> looking at the same thing. And we showed that having IBD did not impact survival. So there's clearly something that uh, needs to be looked at as far as presence of inflammatory disease and how it really affects um, uh, the ability of somebody to be transplanted, their survival outcomes, et cetera, um, in CGD. But in general, it's a very, this is very great, good survival. This is a transplantable disease um, and um, for the most part shows very good outcomes. So gene therapy. So this was recently published by Don Cohn in Nature. The initial gene therapy trials that were done about 10 or 15 years ago were shut down because um, there was a high incidence of my, um, acute leukemias associated with the vector that was used for gene therapy. And so everybody went back to the drawing board and, you, and basically used a different vector. And so this is a lentivirus uh, vector. And you can see they published on nine patients uh, that received gene therapy with this vector. And I just included some of the, the um, figures in the slide, although there's clearly many more than this. Um, that showed that uh, neutrophil DHRs recovered in the majority of patients and were sustained over two years, and that the vi vi uh, vector copy number um, also uh, was sustained after the gene therapy. And you can see the outcomes of these nine patients. So um, the majority are clinically well, Many, most are off antibiotic prophylaxis or off of um, immunomodulatory therapy. There was one death, um, this is patient eight, um, and that patient died of an intracranial um, hemorrhage. I can actually speak a little bit about this patient because this was my patient that I actually referred to the NIH, um, was a Hispanic patient that had disseminated aspergillosis um, and was receiving granulocyte transfusions prior to his gene therapy. He developed antiplatelet antibodies that were present pre-gene therapy. Uh, received the gene therapy, and those antiplatelet antibodies became so uh, refractory to treatment that he was incredibly thrombocytopenic, uh, was treated with really everything under the sun, and did not respond and ended up having a cerebral hemorrhage secondary to his thrombocytopenia. So it was not related to the gene therapy itself. It was a pre-existing um, uh, autoantibody um, because of his granulocyte uh, that, that developed secondary to granulocyte transfusions. So gene therapy is certainly here. Um, uh, there's still a lot to do as far as understanding how these patients do over time, but it's definitely going to be a modality that we can offer our patients, I think, in the near future. Okay, I'm going to transition to some of the immune dysregulatory stuff that I told you I would talk about, and I just thought I'd show a since, uh, especially since Dr. Altman said it's a little gloomy in Seattle, this is, this beach is actually about a mile from my house, <laughs> so I can explain why I've not left Florida, <laughs> because this is about a mile from my house and uh, is a fun place to hang out, um, you know, when there's not COVID. Um, so just thinking, and when we start talking, and I'm going to completely shift gears at this point as far as talking about immune dysregulation um, and understanding what that means and what these disorders are. Um, but if you look at the International Union um, of Immunologic Societies, which is the IUIS, they publish a criteria which recently just came out in 2019 and tell you the number of PIDDs based on certain classifications. And you can see this classification number four, diseases of immune dysregulation, this number, every time they publish this, goes up and up and up and up and up and up because there's more and more being described every year. Um, whereas some of these the other ones are a little stagnant. We don't have as many diseases of antibody deficiency or complement disorders or whatever. It's really these diseases of immune dysregulation that, that appear to be kind of the new face of PIDD. And so when I think about dif uh, immune dysregulation, this is kind of in my own head how I thought about it. And I hope this works for you because I think it kind of makes sense. But if you think about what the job of the immune system is, it's important you know, we're all trained that it's really important to fight infections and is important for infection susceptibility, but it's not just about infections. It's also important for preventing autoimmunity. The immune system also is important for cancer surveillance, for host microbial interactions or the symbiosis between the microbiome. And quality in the immune system 
always seems to matter more than quantity. If you have a few of something, but they're doing their job correctly, things can stay in order. Whereas if you have a few bad players or bad actors, everything seems to fall apart. And then too much of anything is bad. You really need the right amount, not too little, not too much. Um, it's kind of the Goldilocks effect. And so I put these pictures of these sort of traffic patterns because even in the heaviest traffic, if everybody stays in their lane and they're going the right speed, you can get from point A to point B pretty easily. But if you have one bad player who, you know, creates a car, a, you know, 20 car pile up, nobody's getting anywhere. And so that's kind of the same concept in the immune system. When there's immune dysregulation, it's a bit of a domino effect. Everything kind of falls apart even though the primary problem might be with one cell or one uh, particular uh, gene, um, but it's really impacting the whole system. So manifestations in immune dysregulatory diseases really hit every organ system. And I've, I've um, included or listed several of them here that are by, by far the most common. Uh, so failure to thrive is a big one. Enteropathy that often looks like celiac disease histologically. Um, colitis, uh, which is usually inflammatory, um, autoimmunity, and this can really be anything, anything from arthritis to psoriasis to, you know, glomerulonephritis, any kind of autoimmune disorder. Hematologic dyscrasias are a very common manifestation of immune dysregulation. This is typically autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, autoimmune neutropenia. There could also be lymphoproliferative disease where you have um, lymphoproliferation that is not malignant. Um, and then organomegaly, specifically of the spleen. Atopy can be part of immune dysregulation, so severe eczema, food allergies. And then endocrinopathies are another major feature. So things like early onset diabetes, early onset hypothyroidism, et cetera. And then a, a subset of these patients can also have dysmorphic features. So this group of diseases has been coined a new name called primary immune regulatory disorders. And I will say sort of the father of this is actually in your backyard, which is Troy Torgerson, um, now at the Allen Institute, but his group within the primary immune deficiency treatment consortium really coined this term and it's starting to be accepted in the literature as the sort of uh, subset of immune deficiencies that have immune dysregulation as a major feature. And so these disorders are dominated by immune mediated pathology. So things that are considered autoimmune or inflammatory or lymphoproliferative. And I've listed here kind of what disorders start falling into this category. So things like IPEX and IPEX-like disease, ALPS, CVID, um, interferonopathies, infantile IBD, et cetera. So when you think about PERD, it's important to understand the genetics because the genetics are kind of, I say funny, but they're not really that funny. They're kind of difficult and make it a little bit hard to understand. And so we have to, you kind of have to step back and understand the genetics before you can move forward. So this is a great slide that um, Kate Sullivan actually gave me and I've started using it in a lot of my lectures because I think it explains it very well. If you think about a protein uh, or a gene, that gene is gonna be, if you look all the way on the left of this slide, is gonna be wild type, wild type. You have two alleles, this is normal. So you inherit an allele from your mom, you inherit an allele from your dad, and it's wild type, wild type. And it leads to a protein being produced and that protein is gonna be, that red line is supposed to be on 100. So you're gonna have 100% protein activity. And so everything's normal. When you start having mutations, you can get different effects on this protein. And so if you look at wild type null, you might have a reduction in that protein to let's say 50%, null being the mutated gene or mutated allele, I should say, that you inherited from one of your parents. You might have both um, alleles mutated. So that might be null null, and that might lead to zero protein expression. You might have a mutation in one of the alleles that causes something called dominant negative, where it actually affects the function of the wild type protein. So instead of being at 50%, like you see in the wild type null, you're actually at 25% because the double negative mutation has affected the wild type mutation, or I'm sorry, wild type allele. And then you can have gain of function where an allele has a mutation, but it actually leads to hyperfunctioning or maybe hyperproduction of the protein uh, that it's encoded for. And so the, this leads to terms of different types of genetic 
mutations. So the wild type null might be haploinsufficiency. The null null might just be null. Um, I referred to dominant negative, which is right here. And then your gain of function where you have too much protein production is called gain of function. And so all of these types of phenomenon can happen within the same gene. So you may end up with several different phenotypes, several different diseases based on the type of um, effect that that genetic mutation has on the protein production or protein function. Um, so when you think about the cause of immune dysregulation, there are, and this is really in broad general strokes, um, and I, I always Please think about this in my patients because it gives you something to target when you're not quite sure how to treat them. So certain diseases are associated with too much interferon gamma, and that could be things like interferonopathies. That seems obvious. There's too much interferon floating around, and so you got to get rid of it. And it might be gamma. It might be other interferons. Um, there are B cells that make bad antibodies. So if you're creating autoantibodies and that's leading to, you know, hemolytic anemia, well, maybe getting rid of the B cells is a way to treat it. There are T cells that be, can become self-reactive, and so you might need immune suppression to treat that. Um, in certain disorders, especially where there's a lot of lymphoproliferation, T cells will proliferate but not die, and they can mutate and become cancer. Um, and when you don't necessarily have a specific disease, if you think about these pathways, this is sort of areas that you can block with certain agents. So just how bad is the overlap? So this was a, a paper published by Alice Chan from UCSF and myself and actually with Troy, um, looking at 226 PERD patients that were transplanted in North America. And so you can, we, we separated patients out, um, the investigators did this, based on their genetic mutation, but also the, the um, what, we're, what we were referring to as either autoimmune, autoinflammatory types of symptoms. And then we separated their genetic mutations into certain categories. And the point of the slide is really just to show you how much phenotypic overlap there is, that there's not one specific symptom that really stands out amongst any of these groups. So it's not like you're going to be able to look at a patient and say, you have IBD, so you must have this disorder. You, they, there's so much overlap that they could theoretically have any of them, um, and there's not a good way to, to differentiate. All right, so let me start with one of my cases um, to talk about one of these diseases. So this was a nine-year-old who presented with recurrent sinus infections. Um, he had had several sinus surgeries. He also had recurrent URIs. He had an adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy at age two. None of this really got me going until I heard the next piece, which was at age seven. He had strep pneumonia, bacteremia with bilateral pneumonia. He had to undergo a VATS procedure and was treated with IV antibiotics for several weeks. His mother also had a history of recurrent pneumonias and bronchiectasis, and he has a brother and a sister that also have recurrent URIs. So he, he's seen by an allergist that's in private practice, so he came to me already on immunoglobulin replacement. He had, uh, you know, normal IgG, A and M, but his pre-Ig evaluation um, showed that he had um, non-protective non diphtheria and streptococcal pneumonia uh, titers, including post-pneumococcal -pneumo vaccination. He also was very lymphopenic. So his absolute lymphocyte count was quite low, B cell count was low, T cell count low, et cetera. Um, and so there wasn't a good explanation for this. So I ended up doing a lot more evaluation. He, he also, when he came to me, had had already a bronchoalveolar lavage and the pulmonologist was reporting that it was, you know, very mucoid and had all this cobblestoning in the airway, which he did, the pulmonologist did not know what to, to attribute that to. He had also had some imaging that showed hyalur, mediastinal, and retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy and hepatomegaly. So I did some genetic testing and he ended up having a PI3KCD mutation, which is um, a disorder called PI3 kinase deficiency um, or activated PI3 kinase deficiency syndrome, which is APDS is the acronym for it. It, it, it turns out that his brother, his mother, and his sister all have the same mutation. It is an autosomal dominant disease and is a gain of function of PI3 kinase. So it, part of his immunophenotyping included looking at T-cell um, proliferation, which is over on the right, and then extended T-cell uh, panels showing um, just differentiation of the T-cells. And so what you see in APDS 
is um, base is a is a lack of naive and effector T cells. You basically get this disorder where T cells skip over um, the the sort of army of T cells that get the job done and become senescent T cells. And you see that with elevated terminal effector memory cells, um, which is what we saw in his immune phenotyping. So he is low naive, low central, or I'm sorry, high central memory and high terminal effector memory cells. And this is pretty pathognomonic for this disease. He also had pretty low T cell responses to pokeweed mitogen, to um, anti-CD3 and PHA, both with CD45 and CD3, are lower than what would be expected. Oh, and this is just a picture of what the cobblestoning looks like. This was not him. This was taken out of a manuscript, but I just wanted to show what it looks like um, on bronchoscopy. This is what the bronchi will look like in this disorder, and this is all lymphoproliferation of the airway. So you can see where PI3 kinase is. Um, it's sort of up here. Um, and when it is mutated, you lead to, it leads to increased effector cell differentiation um, and CD8 T cell senescence. You get a loss of T cell function and memory T cell function. And when you look at these T cell developmental markers and B cell developmental markers, you have a shift away from naive to central effector memory and Temra cells, where those cell markers will be much higher versus naive. And then same thing for B cells, you'll have an increase in transitional and memory C B cells and away from naive. So how do you treat this? If you look at this pathway, you can see that mTOR is involved and there's upregulation of mTOR as part of the PI3 kinase pathway. Remember, this is a gain of function mutation. So everything is upregulated. I think I talked, I'm going to skip over this because I talked about this. So downstream in inhibition with mTOR blockade in APDS, so giving rapamycin to patients is actually quite beneficial. So it's been shown to provide significant benefit um, in non-neoplastic lymphoproliferative disease. And it has shown treatment in APDS, but has not really shown as much benefit in the cytopenias and the GI disease as we would have ex expected there to be. Um, but it does show benefit in the lymphoproliferation, you know, lymph nodes in the neck, gut, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what else is available for um, treatment of APDS? So linealisib is a new drug that's being... Um, um, explored. It's been studied in a phase one trial that was recently published um, from the NIH showing that when you give lineolisib to patients, uh, which is a direct inhibitor of PI3 kinase, it leads to basically complete reversal of this phenotype. The spleen shrinks, all of the in vitro markers normalize, um, and it was well tolerated without any safety issues. Um, so this drug has now been bought by farming, um, and they are proceeding with obtaining FDA approval for the use of this drug in, in uh, PI3 kinase deficiency. And then uh, their intention is to open up a pediatric trial as well uh, for treatment of children with this disease. All right, last case. Um, so this patient um, is one that's near and dear to me, is an 11-year-old uh, with autoimmune hepatitis. I'm going to go kind of fast because I think we're running out of time. <clears throat> she was treated with tacrolimus, a bunch of diff different immune suppressing agents, ended up with a cadaveric liver transplant. When I meet her, her new liver is failing and she's dying. Uh, she also has a history of celiac disease. She has lymphopenia and profound hypogam, and her mom looks pretty um, abnormal as well, but she does not have a diagnosis. So my first question is, is this an immune deficiency? She has no infections. She has lots of autoimmunity and growth failure. And so what I challenge you guys to say is, yes, this is, this is our, these are our diseases and we need to put our flag in the ground and take care of them or somebody else will. <laughs> and so this is, these are our diseases. They are diseases of the immune system. And even though this patient has never had an infection that's been significant in her life, she has an immune deficiency. And so this is her. I'm on the right. Um, this is a fellow that used to work with me who's on the left, and this is my patient. And at this time, she was 13 years old. So I'm an average-sized woman. I'm 5'6". So I'm squatting, and you can clearly differentiate that this person has horrific growth failure. She has no signs of puberty at all, even though she's 13. She's about the size of a 4-year-old. Um, so we did some studies. Um, which showed hypogam. This is while she is on IVIG. She has profound lymphopenia. 
<clears throat> and most interesting, she has this huge population of double negative T cells, which are CD4 negative, CD8 negative uh, T cells. So what are double negative T cells? If you remember, uh, T cells are initially double positive. They become single positive as they leave the thymus, and then they become double negative right before they're supposed to die. When you have a huge population of double negative T cells, it's because they're not dying the way they're supposed to. So this patient ended up having a STAT3 mutation. Um, these were originally described by Josh Milner and a lot of others as a cause of autoimmunity, enteropathy, growth failure, and lymphoproliferation. And so you can see my patient's mutation is right here in the STAT3 uh, protein. Um, and this is a gain-of-function assay or luciferase assay that measures gain-of-function that was done by Megan Cooper's lab, showing, you know, really heightened gain-of-function of her particular mutation. So you all might be thinking, I've heard of STAT3 before, that's the cause of Job syndrome, and it is. And remember, I just told you, same gene, different consequence on the protein. So in STAT3, it is, or in Job syndrome, I should say, it is a loss of function of STAT3. When you have a loss of function mutation, you get all these phenotypes, high IgE, you get, you know, pneumonias and dermatitis and all the stuff we see with Job syndrome. When you have gain of function of STAT3, you get the disease I just shared with you. So it is a totally different disease based on the consequence of what happens to the protein. So manifestations of STAT3 gain of function. So Lisa Forbes and I have collected over 170 patients internationally with this disease. And you can see that lymphoproliferation and autoimmune cytopenias are the two most common clinical problems. Survival is not wonderful. It's around 70-ish percent um, by 40 years of life. Um, but is not, you know, as horrific as I would have expected. There is substantial morbidity in these patients, even though they haven't necessarily died. So how do you treat SAT3 gain of function? Well, you treat it with a group of medications called jacanibs. Jacanibs are block jack stat phosphorylation. And you can see in this uh, picture, this is where uh, the, the pathogenesis of this disease happens is you have overactivation of SAT3. Um, which goes into the nucleus and upregulates interferon gamma responsive genes and other cytokines uh, that are involved in the inflammatory cascade. So this is a publication from Lisa Forbes and I showing five patients that received jacanibs with stat pregena function. And this was all off label. And these patients had, uh, you know, miraculous improvement in all of their uh, sequelae. In patients that had enteropathy, they were able to come off TPN. Two had complete resolution of cytopenias. One actually had resolution of HLH with use of ruxolitinib. And three of the five ended up surviving, um, you know, um, uh, with use of this medication. So what about transplants in PERD? Uh, basically, that previous article that I showed you showed that the survival is relatively terrible. Um, we don't know how to transplant these diseases very well, and we have a lot to learn. Um, and that's one of the efforts of the PIDTC, again, being led by Troy. We were also able to show that in these different categories of diseases, many of the symptoms that led them to transplant, if they survived the transplant, did resolve with transplantation, but not all. So it's unclear who is who's the appropriate candidate for transplant and how best to do this to improve survival. Okay, I got to my, see, I finished on time. Our conclusion, so um, inflammatory disease and CGD is still important to treat and it's still a major manifestation of CGD. Primary immune dysregulatory diseases, or PERD, as we're calling it, are a new category of immune deficiency, and I hope I've been able to show you a little flavor of that. The key features are organ-specific autoimmunity, hyperinflammation, and infection susceptibility, and precision therapy is available. So it's very important to diagnose these patients because, as I showed you in the case of STAT3 gain of function, if we had not used jacanibs, those patients would have died eventually. And it's been, you know, it's very remarkable therapy that's really improved their quality of life. And then I'm supposed to show you this word of the day so that you guys can all get CME. So your word of the day is disorder. I will uh, um, come back to the slide. I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, some of whom are at Seattle uh, Children's, specifically Eric Allensbach and Troy, who is uh, now at the Allen Institute. I need to update the slide. Um, uh, who have helped me in, um, you know, a lot of the efforts that we have taken on. And 
with that, I'm happy to take questions and I'm gonna go back to your word of the day just in case folks didn't see it. Jennifer, thank you very much. Um, sure. Let's go back to CGD for a minute. Why is gamma interferon, uh, why does that work? What's the mechanism of action? Yeah, I wish I knew that. <laughs> so gamma why interferon- Why did try it? Um, so it was, you know, that's like, first of all, when it was tried, I wasn't born yet. So it's hard for me to answer what the intent of folks were. Um, but why it was tried is because um, some of the organisms that patients get overlap with disease, diseases where we know interferon gamma is a problem. Um, we also know what interferon gamma does in a lot of other cells. So things like macrophages and NK cells, and it does enhance the activity of those cells. Um, it's unclear what its mechanism of action is specifically in CGD. I have my hypotheses and my lab is certainly, that's one of the major focuses of my lab. So hopefully there'll be more to come soon. Um, the data on interferon gamma is that it uh, prevents, um, is, is effective in the prevention of CGD related infections. Um, and it reduces when somebody gets an infection, it reduces their hospitalization time um, and their length of stay and all that sort of stuff, length of therapy. So um, it's certainly indicated, but there is a lot of um, discrepancy about who uses it and when they use it, you know, even in North America, definitely in Europe. Um, so it's still uh, kind of a controversial medication. So you only use it when there is an exacerbation. You don't use it as, I don't treat these diseases. You, you don't use it as prophylaxis. No, I absolutely use it as prophylaxis. That's where it's actually FDA approved. It's not FDA approved for treatment. It's FDA approved for prevention. So there are some people who will use it when somebody becomes infected. I think that's the wrong move. I use it as prevention. So in somebody who's been diagnosed with CGD, it is a, a medication they take constantly in order to prevent infections from coming in the first place. And is that true of all the different uh, variants of CGD? Yes, yep, yes. Hey Jen, this is Karen Chen. It's nice Hi to Karen. See you. Thanks for your great talk. Um, so we yes. have a patient with CGD who's in the hospital with Burkholderia and developed HLH. I don't know, I was wondering if uh, you had comments about management yep. of secondary HLH. Yep, so we actually just, I don't know if you've seen it, it literally came out last week. We just published a case series of um, four patients with secondary HLH and CGD. And it's, um, Burkholderia was the cause of two of the patients HLH and they both died. Um, so I don't know how sick your patient is, but I would be incredibly aggressive. So they need to have very high dose antimicrobials. And then I've started with standard HLH treatment. So things like um, um, uh, steroids and IVIG, I would stay away from etoposide. I think that's not gonna work. And then we've used, I would check a CXCL9 level. And if it's elevated, I would very highly consider using imipolumab, which is anti-interferon gamma. Um, those we've seen some, I know Michael Jordan has used imipalumab. I don't know if you've reached out to him in secondary HLH. There's, you know, a lot of worry about like, are you going to make the infection worse? I think once you have HLH, the infection actually becomes the secondary problem. The HLH is the primary problem and you really need to, to, to do that, to get on that. Um, and again, I don't know how sick your patient is, but if they're pretty sick, I would start having some palliative care talks and end of life talks if you haven't already. Um, one of the patients in our series was an infant that died within, I mean, like overnight, died within like 24 hours of developing HLH. The other was a, a young man who was not diagnosed with CGD. So the di diagnosis came with the Burkhold area and the, and the HLH. And he um, lived for about 20-ish days, but he was on, you know, full life support on ECMO and eventually died of a cardiac arrest. Um, and both were related to Burkhold area. So I'm not trying to sound like Debbie Downer, but I would take it very seriously and get super aggressive. And I'm happy if you want to call me offline, I'm happy to talk if you want to discuss uh, further. Great. Thanks so much. Sure. We have other questions. 
I, I have one. Um, hi, Dr. Lady. Uh, my name is Anya Lang. I'm one of the uh, clinical faculty here. Uh, uh, just a question about, so uh, with the immune dysregulation disorder, disorders you were discussing, any advice on when you have a patient that you strongly suspect of having, um, you know, patient with autoimmunity, uh, colitis, but essentially neg negative genetic testing, as far as we can tell, any advice on like you, you, empiric treatment with any of the newer specific inhibitors, but you're already guessing. So it's very difficult to, yeah. uh, to even justify I, that. I think you search. So what I tend to do is, and the way I explain it to patients is that we're going to do two things in parallel. One is I'm going to treat your symptoms and we, we don't have a lot of guidance on how to treat it because you're really treating it based on maybe your, um, the clinical manifestation and how it's, how it's, evolving and your histology, that might be what guides your treatment. But in parallel, you should be continuing your genetic evaluation. So I, you know, I don't stop until I've got negative whole exome. And even then mm -hmm. I might try to get, you know, folks at research centers to do whole genome. That's very hard to right. get commercially, right. at least for me, um, if I'm really pursuing it. I think that's what I tell the patient. So we're going to be doing both things at the mm -hmm. same time. And you hope that the genetic part will help answer the treatment part. Um, I typically start at benign, more benign drugs that have less side effects. And if we're failing that, then I move up, then I start getting to less benign drugs. So I think from a GI standpoint, steroids are obviously the backbone. Um, I think after that, it depends if it's, if it's colitis versus enteropathy. I think for enteropathy, the best drug that works for chronic enteropathy is abatacept. Uh, which is Orencia, but you have to really worry about viral infections. So I check patients for their systemic, to make sure they don't have systemic viral infections. And I make sure that their biopsies from their gut don't have any evidence of CMV or anything like that. Um, and then there's all, there's COVID, right? Who knows right. what's going to happen when somebody's, you know, on Orencia and they're getting exposed okay. to COVID. So I think that's the one, that's the one I've had the most, um, benefit with is Orencia, especially in patients who have enteropathy for unclear reasons. For colitis, I think it tends to be more like TNF inhibitors. Ustekinumab is quite good. Um, and then also vetalizumab I've had some good success with. Vetalizumab tends to be much more mild. There's not infectious susceptibility, but it takes a while to work. So if you can try it, give it a few months, and if it's not working, then abandon it. I think if the patient's okay with it, that might be an easier way to kind of mm -hmm. ease into it. Uh, versus something that's a little stronger. Great. Thank you. That's so been much. my experience. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. Very much. Thank you. Sure. I have sort of a theoretical question, which is why do we have these diseases at all? You would think before modern medicine, these would all be fatal diseases mm -hmm. and they would disappear. Um, the one disease that I do see that's sort of in this category is hereditary angioedema. And you would think the same thing might happen with that disease, but the explanation is that you continue to get recurrent genetic mm -hmm. defects in that gene and it, re, uh, it just reappears. So uh, why do you think it is that these disease persist? I mean, I've not really thought deeply about it, to be honest with you, but I think if, you know, if I were thinking about it um, as I am now, if you think about the story of sickle cell and malaria, right, like being, having you sickle cell is stuck around because it made people less sick with malaria, maybe that's the case here in the sense that one genetic, maybe one bad genetic defect is tied to something we actually need to survive. And so, I mean, I'm hypothesizing. I have no idea. I have no data behind this, but I think that why do things persist? Because there's got there's got to be a reason that that related to them that is necessary from an evolutionary perspective. But uh, that's any just other my two questions? Sons. Otherwise, uh, we're going to let you get back to your day's work. Sure. All right. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you guys for having me and uh, stay safe and have a happy holiday. All right. Bye-bye.